My name's Jim Stallings, and I'm the director of the UTD, UT Dallas Chess Program. And first of all, I want to thank you very much for coming out tonight uh, to be part of this uh, Chess Educator of the Year Award Ceremony. And we're very pleased to have Grandmaster Jonathan Ralston, PhD, with us tonight. Uh, I'm not going to say too much because we have a couple of speakers first, so before I get started, I'd like to introduce our Dean of Libraries, Dr. Sheila Daenerys. Thank you, Jim. The McDermott um, Library is honored to partner with the internationally recognized UT Dallas Chess Program and participate in Chess Fest, as I understand this is the culmination of Chess Fest, and tonight's special award for the Chess Educator of the Year. Let me thank Tom Cook, and Dr. Ellen Safely from the library for their support of the Chess Fest. All those books you find in the library on chess come from them. They've been very instrumental in the university's and the library's partnership with the um, chess program. You should probably know Dr. Stahl, who is the reti recently retired dean of the library, was a great proponent of the chess program. I have only been interim dean for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> the library is part of UT Dallas community, collaborates to introduce programs such as this highly successful Chess Fest to campus and the community at large. Yesterday, in fact, we had students gathered in our lobby to watch the chess team experts play blindfolded and explain aspects of the game. Having taught over the years a number of our chess players, you won't be surprised when I tell you that they're some of our most remarkable students. Now to introduce our international guest is one of my colleagues from the UTD faculty, Assistant Professor Daniel Krasik from the Center of Brain Health in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. At UTD, we like all our schools to have large, long titles for, them, <laughs> for their names. Dr. Krasik's research broadly focuses on the way that people attend to and remember information in order to solve problems, reason, and make decisions, something I'm sure is of great interest to chess players. Dr. Krasik. Thank you. Um, I'm here tonight representing the uh, research faculty who are interested in, in chess uh, here at UT Dallas. Uh, one of the great things about having a, a world-renowned uh, chess team is that they're an excellent group to try to study. Uh, to, I'm not a chess expert myself, so to me it's like having people with superpowers that are right here in your own uh, campus to try to uh, you know, sort of figure out how they do this. Uh, it gets into a lot of my interest in intelligence. So we, we think of intelligence as being, uh, there's both crystallized, which is your long-term storage of information, as well as fluid intelligence, which is how you think uh, online in a moment-to-moment in -moment basis. Now in chess, you have the unique combination of needing really both of these things, both how you've stored uh, information uh, over time with expertise, as well as how you, how you think and reason with that information. So uh, along with Jim Stallings, we've been uh, doing some very interesting studies uh, trying to look at perception in chess. And um, so we're grateful to be part of this, this event as well as uh, interfacing with the chess program in general. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, Jonathan Rousen, who's from Aberdeen, Scotland, originally. Uh, Dr. Rousen has degrees from places like Oxford and Harvard and his PhD from the University of Bristol. Uh, and as if that weren't impressive enough, he's also a grand master and has won uh, the British Chess Championship multiple times. Uh, so he's quite an uh, interesting uh, person to have on campus, and we welcome him very much. And uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Russell. Thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks for coming. Um, where can I start? I mean, it's lovely to have you here, and it's lovely to accept the award. Um, when I heard about Chess Educator of the Year, I first of all thought, well, what is that? And why would you have such an award? And I think the purpose of such an award, as I understand it, is that we need some sort of wider thoughts about chess. We need chess to be uh, more than just a game that you play by the fireside when you don't have anything else to do. Um, there has to be a, more points to it, more of a social good. So it's a great pleasure to accept the award as, as a recognition of that value. And uh, I hope that what you're about to hear will be worth you coming out for. I'm going to start just speaking about myself. Um, if I walk away from the mic, just remind me, because it's the sort of thing that happens. Um, but um, if I can actually, yeah, yeah. Yes. 
if that's still easier. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to start by reflecting on why I've got this quotation there. Um, I think this is the heart of the matter, not just about chess, but about life in general in some ways. I think when you really feel touched by something or you connect with something deeply, it's because uh, you recognize some aspect of your own life in it. So I'm just going to briefly tell you about you know, who I am, where I came from. It'll take less than five minutes. And uh, in the process, everything I say subsequently should make more sense. I um, grew up in Aberdeen. I learned the game of chess when I was about five years old, learned from my family. Uh, when I was six, I became insulin-dependent diabetic. And I mention that because that was quite instrumental, I think, in giving me the kinds of mental dispositions that later became relevant to chess. So planning ahead, being prepared, um, thinking things through, calculating things, etc. Um, so anyone who knows someone with diabetes will recognize the sort of potential for a connection there. I wouldn't want to make too much of that, but just to throw it out there as one biographical feature that began it. Then my brother used me as a kind of you know, metaphorical punching bag for a while. He used to play chess and he liked to beat me. He got an ego kick out of it. But in the process I got a bit stronger and I remember vividly the day when I first drew with him and had that feeling of empowerment that you get when suddenly chess begins to make sense. Um, when I was about 10, my family, uh, a lot of problems in my family, it was a you know, breakup of marriage and we went to live in London. And when I was in London, uh, it just so happened I landed in the street of the famous chess teacher called Richard James, who some of you may have heard of. He wrote the book called The Complete Chess Addict. And, and he was. He, he was a, in the best possible sense a real chess addict. And he introduced me to chess libraries and the fact that you could, you could read books and, and learn from chess that way. So that got my appetite going about, oh, this is actually a game you can study. It's not just a game that you can play. Um, went back to Aberdeen and still, you know, adolescent growing pains, um, just trying to make sense of your life, who you are, what you're doing. And chess was a great source of order in the otherwise chaotic adult world that you were trying to navigate. Um, so that's when I really began to get good. And around that time, I was blessed with a bit of providence. I won a book prize, um, a simple chess competition in a newspaper that I got right and got a letter one day saying, uh, you won 250 pounds worth, like maybe $400 worth of chess books. Uh, and a cash prize as well. So at the time it was like, you know, manna from heaven. It was just, you know, fantastic. And it, that coincided with the desire to actually engage deeper in this game. So it was a little bit of, uh, whether it was a gift from the gods or really good luck, uh, I don't know. I'll maybe learn when I die. But at the time I, I enjoyed it and um, felt, felt that somehow this was right for me and I should pursue it more deeply. And then fast forwarding a bit, um, chess and academic studies were in some conflict for a while. But eventually, when I, when I came to the more serious exams, I began to knuckle down and actually get the grades I needed to get to move to the next step, and so it moved on. Um, fast forwarding, just before I got, I, I got admission to Oxford when I was uh, in my final year of school, and it's obviously a big deal. But just after that, I played a tournament in Poland, the world, the European Under-18 Championship, where I suddenly played out of my skin and just played a lot better than I'd ever played before and suddenly realized I might become an international master and maybe even more than that. So I, so I asked Oxford for a year out from university before I went there. Um, and I uh, developed quite a lot in that year, became an IM, began to sniff the GM title, although it was still quite far away, like a kind of pizza several blocks down the road. Um, so I, I sort of managed that. And then uh, gradually, while I was at university, I got one norm after the other, rating went up a little bit. I became a grandmaster just after graduating from Oxford, so it was a kind of purple patch in my life where the two things came together. Um, but then I got a little bit of um, identity flux again, not quite sure what I was doing, um, who I should be, what I should do. I played chess for three years, and as many of you will know, this life of being a professional chess player can be more or less serious, more or less rigorous. Many people have that title of really don't do very much at all. Others take it extremely seriously and compete like professional sports people. And I was probably somewhere in between. And during that time, I wrote Seven Deadly Chess Sins, which is probably one of the reasons I'm here. And in the process of writing that, I had to learn a lot about, uh, a little bit about, you know, popular psychology, some cognitive psychology, some very basic neuroscience. And I began to think about chess in a broader way. And I realized that really, what's fascinating about chess is the, is the subject. It's not so much the object, the game, but the person who's playing it. And that's very much informed what I'm about to talk about. And. Um, for those who are wondering how good am I, I'm, I'm not bad. I'm a, I'm a grandmaster. My current rating is around 2580 PD, which is something about roughly 100 points higher in UC, UCSF, which means that I can compete on a good day with the very best players, but will tend to lose to them. But on the other hand, I'll make quite a big score against most other people. 
and that means that I don't really see it didn't really see a viable future for me as a player. Um, but quite glad to still be part of the chess world and trying to make sense of it from another angle. I would love to have spoken about all of these things, but you know I could speak about chess till the cows come home and often do. Um, many of these things are worth exploring. Um, but I think it's better just, just to walk in mentally, if any of them particularly attract your attention, <coughs> ask me about them later, either in the questions or more informally when we get with you. Um, instead, what I'm going to focus on is two main questions that have come up in subsequent iterations of the um, sort of flyers and, and advertisements for this talk. One is what's so special about chess, and the other is what can chess teach us about learning. And they're quite closely aligned. And I'm going to begin by detailing why I think chess is something you know, quite unique and not merely one of many games. Uh, and secondly, with that in mind, informed by that understanding of what chess is, what can the game teach us a bit more about the process of learning and understanding more generally? And the two main things that are going to come up are this notion of intellectual character, which we'll unpack as we go, and social capital, which we'll probably touch on at the end, but knowing me, I'll probably run out of time, so we'll come to that if we can. The main thing I want you to remember from tonight, if you forget everything else, is this quotation. Because I think, it, for me, it sums up really the heart and soul of what I believe chess to be. Um, in chess, one realizes that all education is ultimately self-education. And you can, I, I don't think I can quickly crystallize what that means, but I hope it will become clearer as I go. Essentially, chess forces you to think. And in the process of thinking, you begin to understand your own thought processes. And in the process of looking at your thought processes closely, you come to understand yourself better. And that's really why chess is such a valuable educational tool. Ultimately, it's the self-knowledge that it gives you. And the, uh, Tim Redmore recognized this from a talk I gave in Aberdeen back in 2007, that for me, it's trying to encapsulate what chess is. It's meaning making through consequential decisions. Uh, that's a bit of a mouthful. But essentially, chess is not just interesting, but also meaningful. And it's meaningful because of this self-reflection that I'm speaking about. Because in order to make sense of the game, you have to reflect upon yourself. And you have to try and make meaning for yourself through the games and the moves and the variations and your relationship to them. It, it, the game obviously gives you the confidence to think, but more importantly, because we can record the moves and reflect on them, it gives us the humility to learn. Because if chess, in the nicest possible sense, makes idiots of everybody. <laughs> and, and that's really what, what it teaches you. It, gives you. it can give you enormous intellectual confidence, but at the same time, it realizes that there are massive limitations to your own, uh, your own abilities. So. so why chess? Why not drafts? Why not backgammon? Why not any other game? And it's a very important question to, to ponder before you even begin to think about the answer, because frankly, whenever chess players approach the deans of university, research councils, the media, whatever, you've always got this problem. And it's saying, you know, why should I give you any attention? What's so special about your game? And I think we have an answer, but I think we have to be quite careful about developing it, because it's not self-evident. We shouldn't just take it for granted. When you play the game, the riches and the boundless joy of the game is you know, there for you to see. But it's not there for people who don't play the game. And we have to remember that, that gap between our experience of the game and other people who haven't experienced it, not really knowing what we're talking about. So the first thing is that you know, historians may quibble about the exact dates, but I mean, however, whatever your theory of chess history is, and they are contested, you know, whether, whether it came primarily from China, whether it came from India, whether it's sort of uh, whether it's real precursor was somewhere in Persia, or whether it sort of began in some other obscure uh, board games from ancient Egypt, I don't really care, frankly. All I know is that it's come from a long time ago and has gone through several iterations of cultural evolution. And because of that, it's no minor thing. You know, it's no minor thing. I mean, a lot of people now compare chess to game consoles and say, "Well, look, the problem is young kids have just got these wonderful computer games." You know, they're interactive, they're, they give them a lot of feedback, they give them all the same things that chess gives you. But frankly, you know, game consoles come and go. Chess has been here for give or take 1,500 years. So the first point is just the historical lineage, the fact that it's survival value. And, you know, if we can buy into evolutionary theory what you want, but it, as a theory of cultural evolution, you know, the, the good ideas tend to survive. And uh, chess is, in that sense, a very good idea. It's also universal. It's the, it, it comes, of course, from around the world. It, it's the epicenter in history was, you know, U Eurasia, as they would call it then. But I mean, uh, it, now, of course, if you go to the Olympiad or any major chess international event, you just see this enormous connection between people through this nonverbal communication that happens through the, through the game of chess. 
And of course, it's much better than Esperanto. Although, if anyone speaks Esperanto, I apologize. Hugely inclusive. The problem is that chess doesn't look inclusive. It looks a little bit elitist. And that's why it's incumbent on us to, to make clear this claim that, look, it doesn't matter who you are, you can play the game. If you can think a thought, you can learn the moves, you can play a game. You can find an opponent who's in more or less the same position. And of course, computers and the internet make it easier to, to match those those pairings more efficiently than it, than it would be in a chess club where you may find you've got an experienced player and a complete beginner who can't really get going. But now, of course, everyone can find the opponent that they, they need. Um, meritocratic, no luck. I think it was John was saying to me earlier that finding a game of skill where, where there's no dice and no real random factors. You can't blame the referee, you can't really blame the weather. You're really on your own. In that sense, it's very, very, that's the source of it being character building, which we'll come to in a second. It's the fact that really, you know, you're, you're accountable to yourself. And there are very few spheres of life where you can say that. Team games, you can blame your teammates. Um, outdoor games, you can blame the weather or the pitch. Chess, really, you can't blame the pieces, you know? It doesn't matter if they've got the knife's got a chip on it or something. It's still the same night, it functions in the same way. So, like I say, especially in Scotland, this matters a lot. We have a lot of rain there. And of course, perfect fit for the internet. And we haven't fully seen this yet. A lot of people complain about chess not being on television. Well, television's a twilight medium. You know, it's not gonna be with us for that much longer, probably. Uh, most people now, well not most, but many people now watch a lot of their television content on the internet. And that's gonna keep growing. And soon it's gonna be handheld devices and we're already seeing early signs of chess software whereby you can play you know, you know, fast games against people on the other side of the world while you're commuting home from work. So chess is fitting this climate perfectly. It's another reason why the game is so important. And finally, and maybe underestimated for the librarians among us, chess has a unique symbol system. You know, it has its own language. And that's not minor either. You know, can give me, you know, backgammon doesn't really have that. Draft doesn't really have that. Um, not to the same degree anyway. Uh, most sports don't really have that. We have a, a symbol system that's very rich and that allows us to speak about the game in quite a sophisticated way. That includes the, um, the symbols that measure the impacts of the moves, you know, the exclamation marks, the question marks, the unclear symbols, etc. So we've got some notion of, of um, why chess, why chess and not something else, sort of unique confluence of qualities that chess has. But now there's the other issue of that's chess from the outside, that's chess selling chess as an object. But what about chess as subject? What about chess as how we experience it as players? Well, you have all of these things. You have concentration, which is you know, something quite precious, something that we actually really enjoy. There's the perceived difficulty of the game. And I say perceived because that's a lot to do with how the game is marketed. You know, I was speaking earlier about um, the way chess is used to market businesses. Chess, chess, has, chess has acumen, chess has sophistication, chess has depth. And um, that's based on the fact that chess is perceived as being very difficult. Wonderful feature of chess is the feedback is ongoing and it's constant. Not only do you have a result at the end of the game, but you have a material count throughout the game. You have a sense of assessment, evaluation. So you constantly have some feeling for how you're doing. Every, every move you get feedback from your opponent in the sense that you know, your idea is met with a counter idea. So this ongoing feedback is a precious factor of the game. You have to make decisions all the time. Decisions, we'll come to more depth in a second, but they're painful. Decisions force you to rub up against different parts of yourself and, and come up with an answer. It's, they're, not, they're not comfortable, and that's, that's basically a good thing. Then there's the inevitability of mistakes, which, uh, again, we'll spur in more depth in a second, but a very valuable part of chess. And then there's the aspect of the community, not forgetting that you know, we are, in a sense, connected by our chess tonight. And there are many other gatherings like this, usually in the context of tournaments and whatnot. But still, the game brings people together. It's a form of association that is very valuable. <coughs> we'll start with concentration. This is a quote from my book, and the one that um, is probably the single line from Chess for Zebras, that, or Zebras, as I would say, but I'm in the US now, so I'll when in Rome and all that. Um, this is, for me, a very important point. You know, this, this is the attraction of chess. It's a, it's a chance to concentrate in a world where concentration is under threat. Where, atten where the internet, we know, for, you know is uh, pretty much a fact that the internet is reducing people's attention spans. We're just not holding as much at one point in time as we used to. Chess seems to have the opposite impact, or less empirical claim that has to be tested, but um, 
we know that really chess is good for you in the sense that it obliges you to concentrate and moreover the concentration is pleasurable. It's not, does it shouldn't be thought of as strenuous. We actually like concentrating. Perceived difficulty, some quotations just to get a flavor for that. I love this Nabokov sense of the invisible depths of chess. And anyone who's really tried to analyze a game, for any sort of you know, grandmasters in the room or international masters will know that it's one thing to analyze your game superficially on Fritz and say, yeah, you know, that was, that was a slight mistake, that was a blunder, whatever. But when you really try and turn a game over and spend, you know, days on it, not just minutes or hours, but really try and get the grips of what happened, you get this nausea, basically. <laughs> you get this feeling like, oh my god, like, where does it stop? You can't really get a real conclusion about a variation until you've spent hours and hours and days and days with it. But again, the issue is perception. It's perceived to be difficult, but that's not, not the whole story. But it is a marketing challenge. Think about marketing almost any product, and you'll think it's about making something very difficult sound easy, right? So it's like, lose, you know, get wonderful abs in 10 seconds, you know, or, or you know, get thick glossy hair by buying this product. Don't worry about your diet or how, old, how much you sleep or anything else. Chess's challenge is that difficulty is the harsh of it and the value of it, but we have to sell that. We have to make people think that difficulty is a good thing. And one way to make that case is that difficulty is not difficult, it's relative difficulty, not absolute difficulty. It's about everyone finding their own level of difficulty, finding a challenge level that matters for them. And it's also about acquiring a taste for depth, because the, the abysmal depths that Nabokov speaks of are only for the hardened people who really want to plunge down there. And there's a dangerous areas for people, as we know, Chess, there's this long-standing association with chess and mental instability. But there's also a wonderful link between chess and mental stability. It's a quotation that comes to mind by Bill Hartston, who's a, an international master from England, who said that chess um, does not make people mad. It, it, keeps, it, keep, it prevents mad people from going insane. And I think that's a very profound point. It's to do with the fact that really chess is a source of stability. It's a, it's a place where you can feel your mind working. You can actually see your own thoughts very clearly. This quote at the end is a bit screwed up. I frankly didn't do my research properly and I couldn't find this quote, but I'm going to trace it afterwards. But it's a comment by Benjamin Franklin to the effect that when you know one thing in depth, you have, a, you have an understanding of everything. And I sort of believe that, but we can speak about that more in the questions. But I think there's some value if you go deeply into something, you begin to see it everywhere. Chick Mihai was here recently, I believe, and I'm very sorry I didn't see him because I've been a huge admirer of his work for a long time. Um, chess is hand in glove with flow, the concept of flow. For those of you who haven't come across flow as a notion, uh, I mean, uh, who, who was at the Chick Mihai talk? Anyone here who's been there? Okay, so a few, but not everyone. So, the concept of flow is important. It's basically saying that there's a kind of state of mind that's very valuable to people. And it's a state of mind where you have a feeling of losing track of time, of feeling very absorbed, a uh, feeling very high, basically, but in a non-toxic sort of sense. Um, and it's a state that's brought about best when you have fairly clear rules. So you, you, know, you have a sense of what, what you have to achieve. There aren't really many arbitrary things going on. Remind me if I do that, by the way. Um, when you don't have many arbitrary things going on, and where you have feedback all the time, where you're constantly having a sense of how you're doing, and um, where your objectives are fairly clear, and where those things are met, you tend to get this experience of flow. But what's interesting about flow is that you need the right challenge level. As your skill level goes up, your challenge level has to go up too. So if you're a, you know, a 2000 player, and you play a, a grandmaster, um, you're going to be quite up in the anxiety level, right? Because you're going to think this is going to be tough. It's too, too big a gap. But if you're a 2,000 player and you come across a 1,500, you're going to feel a bit, a bit bored because there's no challenge. In order to get flow, you need an opponent who's close enough to you in strength that there's a real challenge and a real game going. So chess meets this, um, this quality of flow very strongly. And that's what I said about concentration being a good thing. The love of concentration is um, a big selling point for chess. Decisions being hard is very important. The, the etymological root of the side is, I mean, I don't know the, the Latin and Greek, if I don't hear you, let me know, but essentially it means to cut away. And if you think about a hard decision in your life, that's exactly what you do. You, you wrestle with something, and actually it's painful because you have to let something go. And in chess, we're doing this every 
minute or two. You know, it's really happening all the time. You have to, you know, I really like that night out post. I really want to keep my night there. But if I do that, I can't give him check. But then if I give him check, then the bishop can't go there. And then blah, blah, blah. It goes on like this, and you're constantly facing this agonistic state of mind where you have to let things go. And that's basically very challenging. That's what makes chess so tough, but it's also what makes it so valuable. And it also makes you responsible, because really, again, what is it to be responsible? Is to be able to respond, basically. And that's what chess, chess gives you that feeling of, I can do this. It gives you that sense of perceived competence, where you're taking decisions for yourself, you're responsible for it. And because of that, decisions are not, not just arbitrary, but they become meaningful in some way. They're part of, they make sense to you. It's like, I did this. This is part of who I am. And of course, the decisions lead to mistakes. As night follows day, there's no way around it. And this quote by Dr. Hubner, who, if you haven't met, is a wonderful fellow, slightly irreverent wit, but deep, deep sort of understanding of things. Um, but not such a deep understanding that he would proclaim, you know, claim to understand chess, because as he said here, and as I said earlier, you know, chess does make idiots of us all in a very nice way. And um, it's important not to lose sight of that. It's humbling, but it also allows you to kind of go towards the ascent of thought, but at the same time it says, look, human beings, you know, you're not quite up to it. You're not there yet. What's good about mistakes in chess, and the reason it has educational value, is that a lot of people believe now that one of the main issues in classrooms is children not given a chance to be wrong often enough. They're not given a chance to put their hand up and say, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Uh, and they're a bit too scared to say to their friend, I don't really understand this. There's a kind of hostility to mistakes and to being wrong. Um, but in fact, if you really want to be a good learner, if you want to actually be someone who excels at getting better at things, you need to be very willing to make mistakes. If you want to be creative, you have to make mistakes. And what's so wonderful about chess is that mistakes are permissible, they're inevitable, and you can't really be involved in the game without being very, very fluent in the currency of mistakes. So they're also accessible because we have a, a way of recording the games, and again, this is a USP of chess, it's a unique selling point. We, we have a way of recording the games so that we can track down what we've done wrong in a very precise way. And we have computers to tell us uh, you know, now very quickly where our mistakes were. And what's, just to sum this up, we have you know, a lexicon for it. We have different ways of describing mistakes, all the way from a minor inaccuracy to a major blunder. And that's because they're such a big part of the game. Finally, they're interesting. Um, those who have some background in developmental psychology will recognize the picture of Jean Piaget, who was a Swiss, he called himself a genetic epistemologist, which is a very fancy term, which broadly means that our biology affects how we know. Um, and what Piaget, you know, what Piaget did basically is he looked at young children's answers to things, and he found that the wrong answers were very revealing because the wrong answers show how people are thinking, and more even better than the right. The right answers don't really tell you that. The right answers tell you that they've they've picked up the real deep structures that are wrong. So, a classic example is a conservation experiment where you take two beakers. I can't do it with this mic, but two 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 beakers. One which maybe is very long and thin, but looks looks quite big just visually. Another which is maybe a bit shorter but has more depth to it, uh, or width. And then you, know, you have liquid and you, pour, you, you say to the kids, so there's this much liquid here, and you pour it in there and you say, okay, um, there's this much liquid there, and they can see that it's the same amount of liquid, but they'll still claim that the one that, was, that looked bigger had more liquid in it. And he, he found this fascinating. And actually, looking at it from a chess perspective, you get the same thing all the time with chess. If you ask young kids, you know, why did you play this move? They'll often make very strange, you know, strange case for the, the rationale, what, what was what they were thinking, and if you examine that closely, you get to the heart of the matter about where the where the structure was, where the assumption was, where the where the the error began in a way. So mistakes are really, you know, a very important part of chess and something that we should make more of. But but again, I come back to this marketing challenge. You know, I'll just go back a few slides to to make that point. Uh, sorry, move forward back back a few slides. Back here, concentration, difficulty, feedback, decisions, mistakes. Okay, community is quite a nice word, but the others are pretty gritty, right? They're not, they're not like buzzword selling points. It's not like joy, milk and honey, you know, optimism, hope, dreams, blah, blah, blah. Yes, we can. It's none of that. 
Um, it's it's harder stuff. So I'm not saying go. This is where the expression, the market expression, sell the sizzle, not the sausage, right? What I'm doing here is I'm giving you some insight to the sausage, as it were. Someone said, what's the what's the real quality of chess? What's the real value? But I'm not saying go out and when you're trying to get money for chess, you're trying to sell it to uh, the provost of the school or provost, as I've heard tonight you say it. Um, that you emphasize all these points. Uh, but you need to know it first. You need to understand what the, what the value of your product is before you can go and make the case for it. So we'll go back to, um, oh, go back. And finally, the thing about mistakes is that this is why, this is where my little story at the beginning matters because I, um, the value I've had from chess is that feeling of self overcoming. That feeling where you're forced to look at your mistakes in a very objective, painful way. And you don't deceive yourself by saying, oh, I really saw that. You actually say, well, it would be nice if I'd seen that, but really I didn't. Um, really that mate in one? No, sorry, I just didn't see it. Um, and how, just how quickly we can make uh, rationalizations is scary. Self-justification kicks in as soon as you're troubled by the thought that you're not as good as you thought you were. But when you actually take the courage to look at your mistakes closely, like Jonathan Haidt says here, it's a feeling of honor, a feeling of really getting to the heart of the matter, of, you know, it's, human, it's also a kind of feeling of humility and the honor that comes with humility. It's the feeling of um, looking at yourself very deeply and very honestly is hugely valuable. We don't do it enough, but the best chess players do it as a matter of course. They do it just because that, they know that's the process of becoming stronger, to be really vigorous with their own mistakes. By the way, this book, The Happiness Hypothesis, uh, it's really worth reading. So, the library should order a few copies. A longer quote here, and uh, one of the rules of PowerPoint is don't read out your quotes, so I won't do it. But, um, but look at the things in red. Um, the, the, the main point here is that the, link, the link between thinking and meaning. Because we tend to think of thinking as something very cognitive, very much in your mind, Whereas meaning is more about maybe religion or ethics or something very, very different. And what I'm trying to say is that the value of chess lies in the fact they're much more closely aligned than you think. In particular, the reason I think kids get so hooked into chess is that this statement that, that meanings are, they're, are quiet, they're capped and not data. Now, you're right that capped is not really a viable word. You know, we don't use it for many other things. But it, in contrast to data, it makes the point. In other words, the meanings are not given to you. You can't just say, here's chess, this is why it's good for you. Instead, you sit them down, they play the game, and they get it, they capture it. That's where the captor comes. Um, they seize upon the appropriate clues and make sense of things for themselves. And this, I put children in brackets because it applies to everyone, but this quote was originally about children. And thinking is the skill of our excellence that enables us to acquire meaning. So this is where the value of chess comes in educationally. It's about using thinking for kids to make sense of things for themselves. And to have that experience on tap every time they play chess, to know that they have that capacity to think things through in a meaningful way. And that connects with the next point. We all know the Soviet Union put a lot of uh, money into supporting chess. Um, and the reason they did so, well, many reasons. One, it was cheap. One, it was that you know, chess, unlike many other endeavors, doesn't cost that much. But the value of it, they felt, was that it strengthened the will. Not, not the intellect so much, not the emotions, but the will. And the will really is that aspect of you which allows you to coordinate all the other aspects. Your will is that which you must mobilize in order to make the most of whatever resources you have. Bourdieu, who is a sort of French theorist of, you know, broadly a social thinker, he speaks about the, the will to use knowledge. And I think that's what chess gives you. We study opening theory, we study middle game theory, end game theory. And, but the, com the competitive context of the game gives us the will to use it. And hopefully that transfers to other domains. Your will is strengthened because you, in order to play chess well, you need enormous self-control. Because you're getting 101 thoughts of what you should do and why. You're getting nervous because your clock is ticking and your teammates are waiting. But you have to sit down and apply this knowledge carefully. And again, meaning making through consequential decisions. The decisions matter to you, and they have consequences, and you feel that in a very, very palpable way, in a way that you don't with many other things. And the child who's given proficiency thinking skills is not merely a child who has grown, but a child whose very capacity for growth has increased. 
And this is how chess has to be framed. It's something that, it's not that the content of chess matters, it's not the know that, it's the know how. It's the, the capacity of a person to actually make better use of their available intellectual resources. And that's why I think the best notion to capture the value of chess is what's called intellectual character. Now, this is a concept like any other. You know, you can have uh, 101 ways of describing uh, intellectual values. Dan mentioned, you know, crystallized and fluid intelligence. You can speak about IQ, you can speak about multiple intelligences, you can, um, you know, there's like all sorts of ways of framing what the intellect is and what it does. But I think my experience of chess tells me that the best way of understanding intelligence is to see it as part of your character. Now, you may think crazy, because you can have really, really bright people who are pretty nasty. They have no character in the conventional sense, but that's not really what's meant here. The point is rather that what matters in intelligence is not the inert knowledge you have. It's not your ability to do an SAT or a GRE or whatever. It's actually when, when the crunch comes, are you ready, willing, and able to use whatever intellectual capacity you have? So it's about, you know, when you think of someone's character and why it matters, it's to do with reliability. It's to do with if you put someone in that situation, will they respond more or less well? All of those things I mentioned, so the things, things about thinking things through, making tough decisions, concentrating, they're all aspects of intellectual character. They're aspects of our tendency to react in certain ways. So if I give you a question, are you inclined to just dismiss it as flippant, flippantly, or can you ask a counter question? Can you probe for meaning of the terms? Can you um, try and dissect and disambiguate the terms, if you like? Can you, do you know where to go in the library to look for it? Do you know how to Google search it? These are all aspects of intellectual character. So this term dispositions is not, a, you know, you could say intellectual dispositions, but it's a bit clunky. It's a bit of a jargony term, more of a jargony term. But these issues of inclination, awareness, motivation, ability, in other words, it's not about your basic ability. If I'm, you know, 2600 chess player, but I, but I, come to the board and I can't, I can't use it for whatever reason because I'm distracted or whatever. It's not there as a disposition, you know? What matters is that I can turn up when I'm not feeling so great and still perform well. Likewise, what matters with intellect is that you can apply it even when you know, you're not sitting in a classroom taking a test. But you have intellect when you meet the man in the street who wants direction somewhere or who wants to pose you a question. You can ask me more about this because I can see a lot of skeptical faces in the audience. <laughs> But I think the research challenge for chess is how does chess foster intellectual character? That's for me is the, it's the most fruitful question to ask. Some give a few examples now of what I mean by intellectual character vis-a-vis -vis chess. Okay, a very interesting study in uh, Dublin about grandmasters being good scientists, and what this meant is not that they went in with their Bunsen burners and their test tubes and showed that they could really be great scientists. What it means is that. Our typical way of thinking is to falsify, not verify. So they find that with weaker chess players, chess players lower in sort of hierarchy, they tend to play a move and then they'll look for reasons why it's the right move. So they'll try and justify it. It's like, okay, I'll go there and then he go there, he'll, he'll do that, he'll do that. Okay, great, must be a good move, bang, play it. Grandmaster instead says, looks like a plausible move, let's see why it doesn't work. And they'll start thinking in terms of falsification. Okay? And that's what Karl Popper, a famous sort of philosopher of science, classified as the key to good scientific thinking, was the tendency to falsify and not verify. In other words, if you're the kind of person who has a hypothesis and goes about trying to prove it to be correct, there's a, ver there's a real danger that you're not being scientific. There's a danger that you'll start to see kind of biases that allow you to only think of the things that confirm your hypothesis and not those that would deny it. So what's really valuable about chess expertise is it gives you that instinctive falsification mechanism. So you hear a theory, you hear an idea, and by trying to falsify it, it's not like you're poo-pooing everything, it's not like you're saying this is all nonsense, but it gives you a healthy degree of skepticism. It gives you an ability to, to think, okay, this is a good idea. For example, even when I say intellectual character, I have quite a few reasons why maybe it's not the best way to go. Just because, as a matter of course, chess teaches you to falsify. It teaches you that when you have an idea, to look for evidence against it, not really in favor of it. Storytelling, anyone who's read Chess for Zebras will know this, that I think there's a huge narrative quality to chess. Most chess thinking is the form of thinking things through in a very narrative way. I'll attack on the queen side, he'll attack on the king side. Um, I'll, get, I'll get there first, his counterplay won't quite work out. It takes a very 
beginning, middle, and end quality. And they're usually kind of plots and twists and turns. But the quality of intellectual character shows in the narrative busting details, the details that actually don't allow the hypothesis to be confirmed, that don't allow the story to unfold in a conventional way. The one that sees that, you know, the the pawn promotion at the end is actually to a knight and not to a queen. That sees those details that, that can make all the difference to a position. And that links with those who know some of the Chessons although the chess humor is not our aspect of this. Humor is not trivial. I mean, humor is one of the most important features of the human mind by a long way. Um, Tony Miles made this point about a warped sense of humor. And if you know him, you'll you know, understand that even better. But, but essentially, um, it comes about because we know that chess expertise is manifest as pattern recognition. And if you think of most jokes or most, most uh, funny remarks, they tend to be things that slightly subvert Humor basically subverts things. And that's the, what that means is that it gives, gives you a conventional pattern and then it slightly twists it. So that your mind's expecting something and then it, it, you're given something else. And that's why, you, that's why you laugh, basically. And that's related to surprising yourself. So again, another feature of strong chess players is they're constantly trying to question their assumptions about their position. They're looking to surprise themselves all the time. So I'll come now to the more social side of this. We've got some idea of intellectual character. Um, as I mentioned, there is a chess community. Um, now chess is, can be quite individualistic, but through it, you come to know a lot of people and it's a very precious form of, you know, a little, it's a clumsy term, associational life. But essentially, this is precisely what Robert Putnam, a major theorist from Harvard, felt was under threat in America and the world at large. People are watching TV a lot more than they used to civic society as we know it, that layer between state and citizen, is not as healthy as it once was. People, you know, generalizing crudely here, but this is, you know, a general point, um, are less inclined to greet each other when they're strangers, um, they're less inclined to take part in the same kinds of activity, volunteer activity, um, clubs, etc. These things are dying out in a generic, they may not be in, in Dallas, Texas, but across, in an aggregate they are. And chess is a, is a valuable counterpoint to that, because really what chess does, it gives you something benign to do together, and it gets people together in a very civilized, friendly way. And that's simple, but it's not minor. It's really quite important. And there are aspects of that community that are particularly important. There isn't really a hierarchy to it. There is a sort of status hierarchy in a way, because you have some people who are higher rated than others. But there's no real sense of anyone being the boss. You're all competing on the same terms. There's also this integration of children and adults. So. Um, there aren't many spheres of life where uh, you know, a seven-year-old can beat his grandmother. And that's, you know, that's quite a precious aspect of the game too. And they can compete not knowing who's going to win, which is also valuable. And of course, it's not arbitrary. There are rules. There are some constraints. So, so kids who may otherwise be unruly or adults who may otherwise have unstructured lives find a world where actually there's a lot of clarity and structure. And of course, the reason people come together is that then they have things to talk about. They have stories to tell each other, that shared experience that's, you know, we all know is so precious. I'm not going to dwell on the social capital concept because I, I can sense some saturation in the room. But social capital is essentially um, the value in social networks. It's about the fact that who you know matters. Probably all of the expression is not what you know is who you know. Well, social capital takes that a bit further. Um, but it's particularly to do with aspects of the norms that that, that brings. So the chess community we know that you've got to shake hand before the game. It's a kind of norm, that, social norm that the game brings with it. But there are 101 other ones, but they're a bit more subtle. Um, but social capital has been shown to be promoted through chess. The one, one particular study in Aberdeen, where they find that through bringing chess into a community, a relatively deprived community, suddenly there are a lot of very positive effects. People start to share their cars to get to tournaments. Like I say, there's intergenerational learning between you know, generations that wouldn't otherwise have much to talk about. And there's also, all with that comes certain levels of trust building and um, bridging capital is especially important. It's the link between maybe the deprived community and the richer community. So suddenly you get, we know the stories of kids from Harlem suddenly playing kids in very affluent suburban white schools. And just that, that, that in itself is of some value to see a different world beyond. And it's reciprocal, of course, it's not just one way. Summing up, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, it's a game, but not just a game. Don't let people tell you it's just a game. It's a, an extraordinary game. You can even tell it was a ludic activity. It makes it sound any better, but it's, you know, it's a special kind of game. The hard stuff is the good stuff. Um, that's a difficult case to make, but again, that's not the, 
That's not the tagline of a marketing message. That's really to understand that that's, that's the core of your product. Meaning making through consequent decisions is my way of making sense of wh why uh, chess is so valuable. And I think the educational value of the game is best manifest in this notion of intellectual character, although you can certainly argue there are better ways of framing it. But I hope that that notion crystallized for what I, what I think is valuable about the game. Social value manifests in social capital. And now the challenge on us as people who see the value of chess is to, to make sense of that for the, the wider world. Thank you. between playing music and being a chess player. I mean, I'm a professional musician and a beginner chess player. So you know, as a musician, you learn scales, exercises, theory. You, you learn things sort of by rote. Mm -hmm. But then the process to be a good musician is, becomes very intuitive. Right. But is, is there an intuitive nature yes. to, to the game of chess? I'm just trying to take a news. I did something that I thought would be very easy and it's something that's quite complicated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Because you're going to answer the question. Um, they both share the same thing, which is is that you need to acquire a body of knowledge. And once you acquire the body of knowledge, knowledge, know how rather than know that. So it's not like you're learning facts. You're learning um, in music. You may be learning <coughs> the past masters, the people who've done it before you. Um, and through building up that that sort of body of knowledge or that body of experience and the intuition kicks in later. So the intuition, I'll come back to the actual explicit music aspect of the question, but the issue about intuition is that it's often used in popular culture as a sort of magic factor X kind of thing. If you have intuition, you're somehow a genius. It's so intuitive, you know, it's a wonderful thing. But intuition really, I think when you're not being mystical about it, it's that product of um, experience, basically. It's a product of years and years of building up patterns and databases of ideas. So the, the intuitive musician who suddenly makes that lovely little flourish that you haven't expected, that seems very intuitive in the moment, um, it's the product of prior learning as well. Um, connection with music and chess probably goes even deeper. Um, I would suggest the key word creativity. I do both and I find that um, I'm creative when playing music, especially when I improvise. And in chess also, there's sometimes obvious moves and sometimes there's something kind of out of the box, just like, Music. True. No, there is. I mean, it all depends on the kind of music and the kind of chess, in a way. But it's certainly jazz. Let's the, say, right? Well, yeah. Well, jazz is interesting because it, it's, it's maybe a bit more like chess in the sense that um, there is a kind of core underlying structure, but then there's, it gives way to something much more improvised. Um, I'm not sure if given the kind of answer you're looking for, though, is, is, is it, am I making sense, or is it something that I'm not getting? It's something I'm wondering about, and, and I'm listening sure. to what you say. I mean, I don't know enough about music, basically. I think that's probably what it comes down to. If I if I had a deeper understanding of what it took to become an expert musician, I would have a clearer sense of the parallels. I guess I was referring to, you know, is chess, chess so purely <coughs> left brain analytic, where every, uh, computing every oh, move, no, no, no. or is I'm not right here. Right, and um, for those who can't hear, um, whether whether the connection with chess and music to probe it a bit further is to say, is chess really very much about analytical, um, principally working things out in a very logical fashion, or is there scope for um, more imaginative or creative or uh, spontaneous elements? And the answer is both, I think, because I think. Um, there is a lot of scope for, for, for creative flourishes in chess, for seeing, having insight that's very deep and difficult. But there's also this fact of the matter in chess, which is where the brutality comes in. And where analyzing with Fritz is a real pain because no matter how brilliant or creative or uh, fascinating your insight may be, Fritz will tell you minus 0 0.07. And you think, well, you know, I, I didn't see that deep. I couldn't see all the ideas that Fritz saw or Ripka or whatever. And so the difference with music is that there's, there's no equivalent test in music, I don't think, other than a maestro telling you that's not the way it should be done. Um, the, the, someone once said that chess is art with truth. And you know, it's, a bit, it's a little bit too good, to be, it's a bit too glib to be true somehow. 
but it's um, it's a nice way of capturing that. I think it's a way of saying there is an artistic element to it, but there's sort of a fact of the matter too. So. Okay, uh, you, you mentioned feedback. Is negative feedback as important as positive feedback? I mean, if I can't seem to ever win, you know. Yeah, you need to, um, you need both. I mean, it's, it's clear, but I think, uh, especially younger kids, I mean, someone, I think it was um, the guy on uh, the Chess Cafe website, um, his name escapes me at the moment. No, um, it's the it's the Pando, Pando Fini, the guy who you know famous for lots of other reasons as well. But um, he once said that never forget when you're teaching children chess that ego gratification is the main source of learning. And it's a harsh thing to say, but there's some some plausibility to it. I know from my own experience of teaching kids that they're most attentive and most eager to learn when they feel they're really good at something, and when you're telling them they're really good at something. So everything I said about difficulty and mistakes and decisions. Like I say, you need to know that stuff, but you don't need to make foreground it. So with young kids, you do not want to tell them chess is a really hard game, you really have to think, you really have to decide, there'll be lots of mistakes and it's really difficult. You just don't do that, right? That one that won't work at all. But but through through conveying the pleasure of the game and through saying what a wonderful win you just had, even though you know there was hundreds of mistakes, um, because it can still be a wonderful win. It's not to patronize them. It's not to say, you know, I've had lots of games I'm proud of which Fritz would think are, which is thinking are not so great. So chess is cruel in that way because it's so difficult to be precise and accurate. But um, there is scope for being successful even when you make mistakes. And that was the point I was making about the value of mistakes. Because in most spheres of life, if you go wrong, people say you're wrong somehow. There's something fundamentally wrong with you. But in chess, you can make mistakes and still thrive. And that's why it's such a healthy testing ground. Um, but positive feedback is crucial. Kids need to be encouraged at all times. So, yeah. Can you elaborate on uh, whether there is luck in chess? Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, <coughs> the default answer is no dice, no weather, no referees, no luck. Um, it's a game of skill, not of chance. But those who play know it somewhat differently. I mean, stronger players, more experienced players in the room will know there are many moments, many times in the game where you play a move with one idea and miss a very important resource from the opponent. And it just so happens that you have a resource in turn. And there are two ways of looking at that. One is that your intuition is so well developed that it, it's some, at some unconscious level you saw that. And even if you weren't consciously aware of it, and therefore it's just another aspect of your chess skill. But I think the only more honest appraisal of it is that it feels lucky. Um, there could be another aspect of luck, right? Uh, you're paired against somebody stronger, but it's just not his best day because he's yeah. ill or yeah. something, or, or he's black and you're white and it works out better sure. that way. There, there are also things, quirks of the pairing system as well, so, and there's issues of, um, yeah, like getting somebody on a bad day or a good day. But those are, argu I mean, if you really want to take a hard line on it, some, I mean, the philosophy of luck is very complicated. It's a whole, especially moral luck, people speak about that a lot in you know, political philosophy and stuff. Um, and basically, there's no fact of the matter about it, but my gut feeling about luck in chess is that, um, strictly speaking, there's no such thing, but it, it often feels like there is. Yeah. Well, why do you think it is that, um, in spite of all the social capital and relationships and commonality and common love of the game that chess players have, that when you turn to chess politics, there's such divisiveness and hatred and conflict. Why is that? Why can't they all see logically that the best thing for chess is to promote the game, to be positive about it, and yet they seem like they're their own worst enemies when they get into the political realm? I think the quick answer is because the stakes are so low. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, that's, that's, a, that's not my idea. It's come from basically the more the lower the stakes, the more bitter the struggles. Um, but the more sophisticated answer, I think, is that chess players, I mean, it's, it's, it's sadly, I think it's true not just of chess, but of many vulture activities. Anyone who's worked in sort of vulture organizations, even in public schools, I imagine, um, where there's power struggles, um, even if the stakes are not that high, they can be quite bitter because people are trying to impose their identity, they're trying to impose their will. Um, and if they don't get their way in that realm, where else do they go? So a lot of the people who are in chess politics 
that is their status. That is their their flag on the moon. That's that's who they are. And if they don't get that, then they're going back to another their day job and their anonymity and all all of that sort of stuff. So. Um, I think basically for the people who are in, invested in these bizarre ongoing chess feuds, I know the UCSF has its fair share of them, um, I think it's partly because the, the stakes were low in the witty sense, but I think it's also to do with the fact that for these people, um, most of them really need it. You know, the ones who are causing the trouble, the ones who are trying to discourage innovation and new ideas, are those who have a vested interest in remaining in power, um, because that's really all they've got. And that's, that's the sadder answer, but I think it's true. Uh, well, I'll ask this guy first. Um, does being for a think tank have it, have it your relationship to playing chess and loving chess? Does working for a think tank have any relationship to playing and loving chess? Oh, um, John made a wonderful line when I came in tonight. He said, uh, so you work at a think tank, so what do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, basically, the, the, the wider point to your question, I think, which is that, you know, you're a grandmaster, right? So why are you talking about all this, all this other stuff? What's that all about? And I think it's just because it's incumbent on... The, we explained it earlier to Tim, or maybe it was Jim, I can't remember. There are two things in the chess world. Have you seen the film The Fugitive? Do you know that film? The Harrison Ford film? Maybe not, okay. Anyway, just think of the word fugitive, because basically fugitive means to be running away, going away. And the reason I mention that is that there are two terms that I think are relevant to chess. One is called centrifugal. So that word fugal, again, fugitive, it means getting away. And centripetal is the opposite, it's going into something more deeply. The problem with chess, as I see it, is that um, it's got a very strong centripetal current. In other words, the nature of chess is to suck you deeper and deeper into abstract realms of, of knight f3 and bishop b5 and blah, blah, blah. Very, very, very inch for uh, abstruse, uh, esoteric kind of knowledge. But it also has this centrifugal realm, which is out towards thinking, decisions, um, concentration, uh, friendships, community, blah, blah, blah. And for me, uh, it's very important that we're more centrifugal. We have to start being more like Harrison Ford, basically, in lots of different ways, but especially that one. Um, but in terms of me and my, my own life, I'm working for a thing principally because, because uh, I didn't ever feel fully at home in the chess world. I feel it's a lovely place to, um, someone Someone wants, well, it's a lovely place to spend a holiday basically, but not, not such a great place to live every day of your life. Um, and that's also partly pra pragmatic, just I have a young family now, um, uh, and um, I've got to have a more reliable revenue stream. <laughs> and you know, chess, chess does pay, it's a lovely second job, it's a lovely part-time job, but it's not such a great full-time job. Uh, especially if you're relying on playing, because when you start, it, many people love to teach and love to write about the game, and I do to some extent, but I don't want to be doing it when I'm 60, so that's why I chose to do something else. One more question, then we're going to, okay, two more questions, all right, these two. Uh, okay, uh, why do you think that when uh, some players, or even in other professions, if, when you take an extended break, you tend to do better? Okay, it's a, um, it's a, it's a difficult one to answer, but I know what you mean. Um, okay, it goes something like this, and this is purely speculation, but this is how I understand it. So the question is about, um, you're playing a lot, let's say, uh, you could even think of an example maybe, but uh, let's say a grandmaster's playing, say, 100 games a year for three years in a row, and then suddenly he decides he has this crazy idea to work in a think tank. <laughs> so he goes there and he spends maybe a year or two years there. And he comes back in his first tournament, he suddenly, he's not only as good as he was at the end of his period playing chess, but he's even better. And how could that possibly be? And this is a question for memory. This is a question really about the way that memory is working in your brain. We don't really understand it properly. But essentially, those three years when the grandmaster was playing, he was actually learning as he went. Um, a quick analogy would be, uh, we know that really most of our memories are set down in our sleep. That really the purpose of our REM sleep, or you know, our rapid eye movement when we're dreaming, is that our memories get kind of um, processed properly and structured properly so we can use them better the next day. And I think at a much more macro level, that's only one night, but taking that to a larger time frame, I think what goes on is that the, all of the acquired experience in those three years, all of the setbacks, all the gains, all the things you learned, hadn't been fully processed at the end of year three. 
But after this, those two years where you weren't thinking about it, your brain in its own way was still racking it up, still processing it, still structuring it. So that when you come to play at the end uh, of, of your rest, um, you find that actually you have it all. It's still there. So I'm hoping that's true for me, because uh, <laughs> I, I may have to prove it in not too, not too distant future. So. More about your PhD dissertation. I read a little. I read about it a little bit, and I, I think that it's universally interesting. Not like mine. There's a copy of mine right here right, on right, the right, right. floor. Right. It's completely useless outside of the okay. narrow world of engineering that sure. I'm in. Sure. Okay. Well, my um, question was about my PhD thesis, and um, the first thing to say is that the context in which I began it, I was playing chess professionally. So uh, I wasn't really sure. Like many people, when they begin a PhD, they're either doing it because they uh, don't know what else to do. Uh, or they really, really love a particular subject and they really want to pursue it in depth. And I was somewhere in between the two. I, I kind of had an anchor in the chess world. I was a good enough player to just about pay the rent uh, without too much strain. Um, and it, but I didn't want to be relying on that world forever, like I said earlier. So I wanted to do something that interested me. I wasn't doing it really for instrumental reasons. If I had been, I would have probably done something slightly different. So what I did is that uh, there was a thinker called Guy Claxton, who's my supervisor. He's a psychologist and uh, also very into education now. Um, and I read one of his books and felt that he was someone I really wanted to spend time with. And he'd also written a little bit about wisdom in the past. So um, I suddenly thought, well, wisdom, you know, we talk about that a lot. We speak about people being wise or unwise, or it would be, you know, we have popular, cult popular culture icons like Gandalf, who are, you know, the embodiment of wisdom. And I think, well, why is it the academic world is so shy of this concept? You know, why is it that we'll speak about intelligence till the cows come home? But wisdom, people get a bit nervous because it's got all this value stuff. It's, it's not really, it's, it's, not as, it's not as amenable to scientific inquiry because it's much more value contested. Who's to say who is wise and what criteria? How can you possibly measure it, et cetera, et cetera? I didn't care about that because I was a chess player and I could do what I wanted, basically. So I decided I'll, I'll, I'll give it a stab. I'll try and make sense of it. So um, what I did is I began doing what everyone in a PhD does. I do a thorough literature review. You find out what everyone else has said. So Robert Sternberg, some of you may know, um, he was former president of American Psychological Association. He done a lot of work on wisdom. Someone called Baltes in, in Germany done a lot of work. So there were, there were sort of research programs trying to make sense of the concept, mainly from the point of view of experimental psychology. But it, you've also got this massive philosophical tradition going back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, speaking about what wisdom is and what it means to become wise. So I had to try and absorb all that and integrate it and find something that was missing in it. And basically what it comes down to is we don't really have a problem being momentarily wise. Most of us, at the right moment, on a clear day with the following wind, can give excellent advice and sign judgment to people come and find us. But the problem is what I said earlier about it being dispositional, whether it's characterological, whether it's part of who you are. So me, for me, the nub of the question became, how does it go from being a, an occasional trait that we can access to being something much more dispositional or um, a part of you? And to answer that question, you have to think, well, why doesn't it? So you step back and say, well, what, what are the barriers? What stops wisdom-related change? And there I had sort of seven different categories that I, I picked up from the literature. And they include things like um, something called self-serving bias. So we, you see this a lot um, whereby you, you pick up aspects of an argument that support your point of view, but you ignore the others. So I think John was saying, or I forget who, Jim was saying earlier that most people read the newspapers that are aligned with their political view. Right? That's self-serving bias. We don't really, one of the reasons we don't become wiser is we don't expose ourselves to contrary information very often. And there are things, a simple thing in psychology called negativity bias, which is simply that we're, we're uh, primed by nature to be more alert to threats to us than we are to opportunities. Because, you know, you may or may not it may or may not matter if you get that piece of fruit to stay alive, but it matters a lot if the tiger behind you, you know, gets hold of you. So we, we, we're more conditioned to be averse to threats and, and, uh, than we are to opportunities. So negatively biased means that certain opportunities for growth we don't take. And there are many others like that, so this, I won't go into all of them, but there's detailed things like that that are part of our sort of physiological, psychological constitution. I call them psychosocial constraints. There's also things like status anxiety which is basically keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know if you use that expression here, but yeah. basically the idea that we all want the bigger car, the better house, the better, more neatly mowed lawn, that's very deeply ingrained in us. It's not some sort of quirk. It's, it's a huge part of what it means to be human is to, to try and project that status to the outside world. 
And that also gets in the way of becoming wiser because if you're too busy worried about your financial well-being, you don't have as much time to cultivate the, the virtues that you need to become wiser. So it was all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was a lot of fun to write. I had a great time. Um, there's now some interest in getting it published, so watch this space. It's not available online, It's not available online because I want to publish and make money out of it. Now we come to the all-important moment where we get the award, and we're very fortunate to have our associate provost, Dr. Abby Kratz, with us. She will make this award. I, I would like to add that Dr. Kratz is extremely supportive of our program. He knows all about the chess team. <laughs> <laughs> I know all about the chess program, not about the game, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, uh, I want to thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to immerse in a little of your thought and uh, to share insights that you have given us. I think uh, I'm very interested in what you had to say about mistakes. I want to say that one thing that's very clear tonight is that there was no mistake made when you were named Chess Educator of the Year. And so I'm very, very happy to be able to present to you this moment.